Good morning and welcome to Wisconsin Wednesdays. It's Wednesday, the 2nd of February. It's hard to believe we're already more than a 12th of the year through. My name is John Green with Association Member Benefits Advisors. I'm joined by my co-host, MJ Woodall, along with the entire staff of WREA. We're thankful that you're here today. We're going to tackle the basics of long-term care. We're going to get into that in just a moment. But before we do, just a couple of housekeeping details, especially for those of you who may have joined us for the first time here. All participants are in a listen-only mode. And what that means is, unlike the normal Zooms that you may do with your grandkids or through your Sunday school class, you all participants are in a listen-only mode, which means that if you have a question or you want to um, speak on something, simply drop it into chat or the Q&A feature. MJ and the WREA staff and I will monitor that. We'll stop periodically throughout the conversation, address those things. And then what we have done in the past couple of webinars is we will stop at the end of the conversation, stop the recording. And if you want on your reaction bar to hold your hand up, we can recognize you. And if you don't want to type it in, you can just ask the question that way. So we have some good dialogue even after the conversation is over with, so to speak. So feel free to jump in on that. Use the chat. Use the Q&A feature. We're appreciative of that. You'll also notice this QR code down here in the bottom right-hand corner. You're going to see that at the end of the conversation today as well. If you're joining us on your smartphone, all you have to do is open up your camera feature on your phone, just like we do in restaurants to sometimes scan QR codes for the menus. You can scan that QR code and that will get you uh, ability to ask specific topical questions or things that you want more information on and we can get back to you as well. So let's go ahead and get jumped in and rolling here because I'm excited about what we're going to do today. And we want to talk about, first of all, I'm going to turn over to Diane. And Diane, if you've got any updates you want to tell the, the, the folks on the call today, and then we'll turn it over to Annalise to give us a tour around the, uh, the great WREA website. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here. Uh, just very quickly, I want to welcome everyone. Um, hopefully, uh, our weather will stay good and we won't be getting any snow that they're getting down south. Uh, further. So we're doing good. Again, I want to remind everybody to check out the events page on our website and you'll find all, all sorts of uh, webinars and book study and fireside chats and things like that, that you can participate in and be continue to be engaged in WREA. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it, I think, over to Annalise. Correct. Annalise, I'm going to stop sharing here and let you take control and kind of walk us around okay. your incredible website and tell us what you know where things are where people can find out about all the great events connect things stuff like that as well so okay so here is our um can you see my screen all good um, yes yes okay all right so here is our website wrea.net just put that in and and this page should come up um both John and Diane were talking about our events page, the tab right up here at the top, just click on that. And you can sign up for Wisconsin Wednesday webinars, fireside chats, Diane's webinars. Um, so I'll just show you real quick how that works. You just click on the item that you want to sign in for and click and scroll down for the register in advance. And this little, can you still see my screen? Yes. Okay. And you can check which ones you want to attend. And you put in your first, last name, and email address and click register. You'll get a confirmation email right away. And then the day of, Diane will also send a reminder email in the morning. So I'm going to go back to the home page. And in case you want to view the recording of this particular session again or previous sessions, you need to log in to the website. So you just scroll down, go to the sign in page, enter your username and password. Your password should be your eight digit member ID and then click sign in. And then to get back to the website, click on quick links, the home page, and under the about us tab, right next to events, 
you're going to go to member resources scroll down and you can view the Wilsinski webinar recordings and just know that those particular recordings have a passcode and it's provided right here. And then for the Wisconsin Wednesdays, we have uh, the past four Wisconsin Wednesdays. Um, we had a fireside chat with some handouts so you can check that out for the AARP um, Fraud Watch Network. And then there are legislative resources. And I know that you guys love reading material. And here are the bylaws, which are on our website, but you do have to be logged in as a member to view them. So that is just a quick overview. There's lots of materials in here. And um, if you don't know your username and password, give us a call or send us an email and we'll be happy to provide that for you. So um, that's all I have. I am gonna stop sharing, John, and you're back on. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I learned something every time and I hope that uh, the folks on the call did as well. I can tell you, I work with several associations across the country. The depth of programming resources that you have at WREA is outstanding. So Annalise, thank you for showing us through that, walking us through how to register for that, all the different things that are out there, more than just Wisconsin Wednesday, so many different things. I think you'll probably have book talks scheduled later on this year as you get deeper into different things. So Lots of different things out there. Again, just a reminder, if you have a challenge logging on, need your, your member ID, that kind of stuff like that, give the office a shout. And I'm going to have Annalise or Lori, somebody put that in the chat, the phone number for WREA. They can reach up there as well. So again, thank you very much for showing us around. Let's go ahead and get jumping and rolling right in here. Again, my name is John Green with Association Member Benefits Advisors. I live a little bit north of Houston with my wife, who is a second grade elementary school teacher. She teaches at the same school that she went to and my three kids went to. I spent most of my career in schools helping active educators understand what life is like on the retirement side so that they're better prepared whenever they come out, can connect with their retiree associations, and uh, enjoy what they worked for all the years they put in in the classroom as well. So I want to introduce my co-host that joins us along here. MJ Woodall, who is our leader in Wisconsin. So MJ, good morning. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Good morning, everyone. And thanks again for um, having us. Uh, so MJ Woodall, I am the district manager for Wisconsin and a few other states. And I love doing these webinars for all of you. Um, it's a great way for us to be able to get um, some more resources in your hands and help give you some education around things that maybe you want to know a little bit more about or maybe didn't have a lot of information about just in, in general. Uh, this picture here is just a picture of my husband and I last, um, I guess it would have been November, I had to stop and think when it was, we went to the inaugural event of the Stars and Stripes Honor Flight here in Brookfield, Wisconsin, not too far from where I live. And we were able to help raise a lot of money to help um, help our veterans really get back and go on that honor flight and kind of relive that experience of being able to um, be on the flight, you know, get the mail call, all that stuff, um, visit the wall and really be with um, others, you know, just to kind of really celebrate who they are and what they did. So we try to always give back within our community. And this is one of the many ways we were able to do that. So that's my husband, Brian. We've been married for 28 years. Um, he actually cares for individuals during the day. He does that um, kind of as a side thing that he does where he provides private care for individuals. So we're very familiar in our household uh, to the things that we're going to be talking about today, meaning the, uh, the care and what that looks like, whether that be in home, um, in a facility, or um, in a nursing home. I have two sons. One is working uh, with us. His name is Chris. And um, John is, is looking at the opportunity as well. And then my one-year-old uh, puppy, who I gave a treat to in his little toy, thinking it would keep him busy for at least a half hour, 40 minutes. I look down and it's already gone. So that uh, we'll see what happens with that. But anyways, that's a little bit more about us. I'm going to turn it back over to you, John. Okay. Thanks, MJ. I appreciate that. And uh, glad that we've got a chance to have you on here. Just a quick reminder, especially with legislative season kicking off here, WREA is always looking out for your pension. 
as a watchdog you saw there at the bottom of the website whenever Annalise scrolled down that mean looking watchdog on there it's always looking out for your pensions helping preserve those health benefits that you worked for keeping you connected to like-minded individuals that were retired educators or are still active educators as well and then combining all those important benefits and things like that and discounts and fun stuff on top of that that's the importance of having WREA and AMBA together because it can help fill those things that aren't covered by your state or your district benefits. They're portable if you leave the state for whatever reason. There's no network involvement in a lot of some of these benefits. And so that way you can take them if you winter down in the South, wherever you do, you have that availability to you as well. And then most importantly, WREA members tell us that they appreciate being able to extend their benefits to adult children who maybe have aged out of their benefits through the state or to parents, something like that, so that they can make sure that they have a, a relaxing retirement career because they're not having to worry so much about taking care of an extended uh, needs for a loved one. And we're gonna talk about that today. We're gonna talk about this whole concept of long-term care insurance, long-term care needs, elder care, just a lot of different concepts in there. We're going to kind of jump around and identify some of the myths and facts around care, about the need for it, the traditional components. We really want this, and whenever we talk with Diane about this, we want this to be an educational opportunity for you to help understand the components that make up this whole care picture out there. Learn the cost, learn the cost of waiting, solutions that are out there, and make the most of your endorsed options. I want to take a poll real quickly, just so that... Uh, MJ and I understand who we have on the call today. So what I would like to, is a totally anonymous poll. We've got this out here. We'll help keep it up about 30 seconds. Want to know how many of you have some sort of long-term care coverage, or you think you have it, something like that, or you've made plans for your long-term care. That will kind of help us go through our conversation and help us explain elements and uh, talk about those things out there. So We'll leave it open for just a few more seconds. All right. We've had a pretty good uh, amount of response out here. Let's share the results. I am very pleased. I'm very impressed. We've got about a 50-50 split of group that uh, have made some type of long-term care plan, um, some that haven't. So let's go ahead and... Uh, We'll stop sharing that. We're going to talk about that as we roll through here. But part of the reason why we share this about protecting your future is because the concept of long-term care goes beyond just you and your care, or maybe your parents' care. It's a multi-generational impact. And I want to show this. This is the reason why I give this conversation. I'm so passionate about it. This is a photo of my dad and I back in July of 2020. This was at his long-term care facility in Austin. This was the last time that my dad remembered who I was when I went to visit him. And so he passed away that October um, in 2020, and he got great care. And because he had prepared for that, it was not near the economic burden on my stepmother, my brother, and I and allowed my stepmother to continue to live in the lifestyle that they had grown up. So that's why MJ and I are passionate about what we talk about today, because her husband sees this on a daily basis. I experienced it for two years with my father and how I'm preparing for my mother and my stepmother in the same situation as well. So we're gonna jump in and talk about a lot of things, but I wanna give you a quiz. And there's nothing more that I love to give a bunch of teachers than a pop quiz. So. Just a little payback there, Diane, for that uh, French teacher pop quiz that came in. I know you taught German, but uh, my French teacher, Miss Hamilton, used to love to give pop quizzes. And uh, so here we go. True or false? I want you to write this down. True or false? Long-term disability and long-term care are the same thing. True or false? Very few people need extended long-term care or only people over 50 need long-term care. True or false, nursing home confinement is the only care option there is out there. True or false, Medicare pays for everything. Or true or false, I should just wait until I decide till when I retire about these things. Okay, in every situation, the answer is false here. 
We're going to explore these myths. We're going to talk about these things from a statistical standpoint, get a little bit uh, um, simplifying some of the verbiage, things like that, especially for the half of you who have made some sort of a plan. We're going to kind of talk about what's out there and maybe show you some things that we want you to go back and look at. Maybe pull your policies and pull your plans and, uh, and review those because there may be some things in there that you want to take care of. And we're going to talk about that as we roll through here as well. So no matter whether you answer true or false to these things, no matter whether you've got a plan or you don't have a plan, the fact is that once you reach over 65, 70% of everyone over that age is going to need some form of extended care in their lifetime. Now, it may be in a facility, it may be at home, it may be for a shorter period, it may be for the rest of their life, but it's a significant number of people, percentage of, our, of people over age 65 are going to need care sometime in their lifetime. Now, I want to talk about the traditional components of a traditional long-term care plan. And when I say traditional long-term care plan, some of you on this call today may have taken out a plan through your school district, a group plan, or may have taken out a plan many, many years ago. That's great. I applaud you. My father did the same thing about two years before he had his first stroke at age 62. So I applaud you for doing that. I want to kind of go through those traditional components because things have changed a little bit, but it may help you understand what's out there. I'm going to illustrate this in the form of a hamburger. So you think about a really good hamburger, you start out with the buns and the buns are the qualifications, the triggering event. If you just have a hamburger patty on the side, it's not a hamburger. This is a long-term care. You have to qualify to receive your benefits one of two ways. One is your activities of daily living. So think about things such as feeding yourself, bathing yourself, being able to go to the restroom and wipe your backside, those type of things, dressing yourself, those are the activities of daily living. Once you lose two of those activities of daily living in your traditional long-term care policy, that triggers the ability for the policy to pay. On the other side, the top bun, so to speak, is the cognitive impairment. Think Alzheimer's and dementia. That was my father's issue. He had vascular dementia related to his strokes. And so while he could still do all of his activities of daily living until the last couple of years of his life, the trigger of the cognitive impairment, and you've seen people with Alzheimer's, I know Brian probably has MJ's husband, that Alzheimer's patients can do everything. They can still do all the stuff that they did before, but they just don't know, you know, who they are, where they are, that type of thing. So you either have a cognitive impairment that triggers a benefit or the activities of daily living and your doctor certifies that you can't do two of those things, that's what triggers the benefit amount, the long-term care policy to start to, to pay. And the meat of the policy is that daily benefit amount. Historically, you would have $100 to $300 a day of benefit or a pool of money that says you will receive X number of thousands of dollars maximum over your lifetime. So that's your daily benefit amount triggered. Some policies paid it uh, no matter what your cost was. Other policies would only reimburse you up to that amount, depending upon what your costs were. Then you had a length of coverage. Old traditional policies were like three years, five years, or lifetime coverage or that pool of money. So if the pool of money ran out in two years, you were done. Or some said, we're going to pay you X number of dollars every day for three years or five years or lifetime. So that's your traditional plans. Then on top of that, you had an elimination period. And think about an elimination period as kind of a deductible on your homeowner's insurance. If a hailstorm or tornado rolls through and you have to have your roof repaired, you have to pay the first X number of dollars, $1,000 or 1% out of your pocket before the daily benefit kicks in, before the insurance coverage takes place. Elimination period works the same way. Most plans had a 90-day waiting period. Some had a 180 day waiting period, some even longer, that type of thing. What that basically means is, is you have to come up with the money first to pay for your care. And then after 90 or 180 days, the policy kicks in at that point. Then location of coverage. Under traditional long-term care policy, most of them were you had to receive your care in a nursing home or an assisted living facility. 
So we're going to talk about some alternatives here in a little bit, but location of coverage, location of where you get your care provided for you, part of a traditional long-term care plan was pretty restrictive of where those things were. And then you had inflation protection and non-skilled services. Inflation protection would be if you had $100 a day worth of daily benefit, and then you had a 5% increase in that every year. So that next year when your policy renewed, you got $105. And then some were compound, some were simple interest, things like that. It just allows those that had an old policy to make sure that their coverage stayed up with the cost of, of what care would be. I'm gonna show you what the current cost is in, in, in uh, Wisconsin and kind of let you see what that looks like. But that inflation protection, some policies had it as an automatic feature other policies, it was an optional rider that you put on top of it. Could be kind of expensive. Some group policies didn't have it in there. So it's really important that you review that because if you took out your policy back when you were an active employee, then it's very possible that uh, that may not have kept up with the cost that you have out there. So let's check that out for sure. And then non-skilled services. Most traditional long-term care policies were very strict about who could provide care for you, meaning that it had to be some type of skilled nursing environment or something with registered nurses in a skilled location, as opposed to just having someone that came out and cooked for you or maybe changed your clothes, things like that. So it's important to understand those things and, and what happened in regards to uh, um, those long-term care policies. And we're gonna talk about that in our 201 session but I kind of want to focus a little bit more now on what is this whole concept of extended care? Because used to traditional long-term care policies, and I'm thinking about my grandparents, that once someone was no longer able to take care of them at home, you put someone in a nursing home. That's just the, the phrase we used to call it. They go to a nursing home. Extended care is beyond that. It's care in your home. And it could be by somebody who is skilled and paid, or it could be more than likely somebody who's not paid to take care of someone. Care in a nursing home or a long-term care facility, or now you're starting to see these hybrid communities called assisted living communities. Over near my, where my son and daughter-in-law live in Houston, there is a massive seven-story, gorgeous new facility that is designed for families that have early onset Alzheimer's or dementia, where they can be taken care of and live with their spouse but as their Alzheimer's progresses, there is more care that comes in and takes care of them. So it's a really a beautiful facility. I'd love to take a tour of it at some point, like some really fine apartments. So there's lots of different opportunities out there, lots of different things maybe associated with um, churches or Masonic organizations, fraternal organizations, things like that. So some of these hybrid communities that are available out there are really redefine what extended care means and what your options are as you go forward. And how you pay for that extended care really varies across the board. And that's predominantly why MJ and I are here to have this conversation with you today, because most people, unfortunately, pay for any type of long-term care out of their personal savings or their assets. And you can't call the pension board in Wisconsin and say, hey, my spouse just starts needing long-term care. I need you to increase my pension you know, because I've got to take care of him. So there's personal savings and assets you have to spend down. The biggest thing, assistance from family and friends that come in and help, maybe a son or daughter that has to stop their career to take care of a parent, something like that. We'll talk a little bit about Medicaid. And then we're going to talk about that extended care option, the coverage that's out there that's available to you as well. Because you never know what you need and when you need it. I'll give you an example of my father. Whenever he had his major stroke in surgery and had to be at that point, my stepmother could no longer take care of him. We went looking for a facility for him. And of course, we all know that as you age, you're not able to take care of things and do things the way that you used to in the past. So we had to have a facility where they would take care of my father, but I would go visit him when I would be over in Austin. And I would notice that there were people that were younger than me in there. And I'm in my mid fifties. And I was blown away. And so I talked to the nurses and things like that and the staff there. And they said, this person had a traumatic brain injury due to an accident. 
or had a stroke in their 40s. So I was surprised at how many people needed long-term extended care, even at a younger age. So you never know when that's going to happen. You can't just plan for it all at one time. And some of the myths that are out there, and I, I really wanted to spell this, is that health insurance is going to cover all your long-term care, or that Medicare is going to cover all your long-term care. And that Medicare and Medicaid are the same because those are not true or that I need to just wait until I'm closer to 70 to buy some type of long-term care plan because all of those are myths. We're going to touch a little bit on those as we go through here. I'll have MJ kind of share a story that she had with a particular lady that, uh, that fell, the totally healthy that fell and talk about that here in a moment as well. We've talked about what extended care is, we really kind of want to hit a little bit on where these services are provided. Most everyone wants to stay in their home if they're getting care. It's where you grew up, it's where you're comfortable, it's a familiar surrounding, no matter what your situation is, you're much more comfortable there. Good plans allow you to be, recover or get taken care of at home. We talked about the communities, the assisted living facilities, those progressive care communities that are out there. And then finally, nursing homes. Some are very specific in what they have. Some are meaning that it's memory care related. Some are general in nature in how they operate. So let's look at the cost. And so we, I would encourage you to write this website down. And I'll show you that website in a moment. But Mutual of Omaha is a company that we work with. And they do just kind of a cost survey across the board and say, what does it cost for a home health aide to come in on an hourly basis to take care of someone in their home? Or what does it look like in an assisted living facility or in a nursing home? And you can see out there, it's anywhere from $56,000 a year to have a home health aide come in, all the way up to $123,000 a year for a private room in a nursing home. Now, this is a national look. For my father, it was about $6,000 a month, right outside of Austin, about an hour away from, from, from Austin in a nice facility. It wasn't the Taj Mahal, but it was a very nice facility. When I got to looking at the cost of care in Wisconsin, I was blown away at the cost. And MJ's nodding her head. Uh, I was floored at how expensive it can be up there. So I kind of looked at, you know, major metropolitan area, college town, and a little bit more rural up in the up north part of the state. So you can see there that range for a home health aid, even $5,000 a month, you know, $60,000 a year is for someone to come out and take care of those basic needs for you, all the way up to over $11,000 a month in Milwaukee. That's incredible. And uh, so you said you can see that cost there. MJ, you want to tell a little bit about the lady you told me about that uh, had slipped and fallen on her way home from church? Yes. Um, so I was on the phone with one of our members and she had slipped and fell actually at church and she ended up going into a nursing home after, you know, she was taken to the hospital and everything. And because she did not have three um, overnight stays because it was a slip and fall, um, they, you know, Medicare, unfortunately, was not going to pick up any cost of that nursing home. She had a long term care plan in place at the time. But her long-term care plan, like probably many of yours, had an elimination period. Standard in the industry right now is 90 days. Gone are the days where you've got no elimination period. If somebody has one of those, that's awesome. But they're really few and far between that I even see those. Sometimes I'll see 30 days, but most often it's 90 or more. In her case, it was a 90-day elimination period. So what that meant is she had to pay the full cost of that facility in the nursing home for the first 90 days before her plan, her long-term care plan picked up on day 91. She was there, it was either 92 or 93 days. I, I get that a little bit mixed up, but she said her plan only covered about $800. That's because it only paid for either that two or three days of time from day 91 through 92 or 93. The cost of care at the facility that she was at was $336 a day. You do the math and you multiply that times 30, that cost was $10,080 a month. And she did not have the plan that we have in place um, as one of the endorsed benefits by WR, uh, WREA, vetted out by WREA, vetted out by us. She did not have that in place at the time. I ended up working with her to fill that gap because it's got a lot of wonderful things in this particular plan. 
And we filled it with a $300 a day benefit for her to cover the first 90 days. And she said to me, if I would have had this plan in place, MJ, are you telling me if I would have had it and I would fall, would have fallen or I'd fall again and I go into the nursing home and everything that is the same, if the cost of care was $336, you're telling me this plan would pay for 300 a day and it would only cost me 36. And the answer is 100% yes. And that's the value of the benefits that you have available to you through the association. And a lot of times I will hear individuals say, well, I can't get approved for long-term care, right? Believe it or not, this benefit has been able to approve individuals that weren't able to get approved for long-term care in the past. And traditional long-term care can be very expensive, especially for us women. We have a tendency to outlive men statistically, and it ends up costing us more for care. In the plan that um, we have that's endorsed again by the benefit, it's a plan through Aetna, the cost is there, or the rate does not get impacted based off of whether you're male or female. They look at your current health and they look at your age. That's it. So, and meds that you're taking. So a lot of, a lot easier on the underwriting side of things. But the beauty of that situation is, is we were able to get her protected. I hope nothing ever does happen to her again, but she feels just comfort knowing that she won't have to go through that. Exactly. Thank you, MJ. And MJ is, is kind of set up our conversation for the 24th, uh, the 24th at 16th. I'm sorry, looking at the calendar wrong on the 16th. We're going to dive in deeper on kind of some of those issues. If you've had some things that uh, may prevent you from long-term care, some alternatives, things like that. But I encourage you, write down genworth.com. Go to genworth.com and look on there for cost of care or cost of aging. And you can plug in your zip code. Put your zip code in there, your city you live in. It's going to give you what the costs are for each one of these particular situations. And you can kind of get an estimate of what it could be going forward there. And so when it comes down to paying for it, as MJ talked about with, with her client, oftentimes you've got to tap into your savings. And sometimes those funds may not be available when you need them. So I'm thinking about everyone has a pension. You can't call the pension board up and say, hey, send me more money advance me some of my checks, that kind of thing. You may have had an old 403B or something like that that you've got that you have access to, but right now the stock market has dropped significantly. You don't want to buy dollars, spend money that you had need to rebuild back up. You may have to sell some of those assets. It may trigger some taxes, things like that, and loss of future earnings. People talk about Medicaid. Medicaid is truly a last resort program for people with limited assets. I've looked at several different states, especially in Wisconsin. Usually, an educator with a pension doesn't qualify to, to be on a Medicaid program or a Medicaid option there. You have to spend down your assets well in advance. And oftentimes, there's a look back period, and the state seeks to reimburse, get reimbursement from your estate. And I can tell you from firsthand experience the facility my dad was in, there were three wings. And two of them were for private payer, meaning people that paid their own or had long-term care pay for it, well-staffed, lots of activities, great place. The Medicaid wing was the third wing, didn't have as much staffing, no activities, would not be someplace that I would want to, to, for a loved one to have to be. So Medicaid is not really the best route. In 201, we're going to kind of talk a little bit more in depth about it, cite some rules and laws and things like that as well. John? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry to interrupt. Do we want to take questions right now or do we want to hold till the end? Yeah. Is there a question that popped up that we want to? Uh... So there's two that I can, um, that I can talk to. One of them was uh, uh, somebody had asked the question about a cognitive impairment and that would that pre-existing condition disqualify? We actually have two benefits available through that program. One is a recovery care, which gives you the ability to have facility care and home care. And the other one is home care. If you tried to apply for long-term care with a cognitive disorder, it would be an automatic decline. We could potentially look at the home care plan that we have available. And if you're interested in learning more about that, as John had mentioned previously, just hover over that QR code We'll also have an email and a phone number that we can give you as well. And we can have some further conversations specific to your situation. 
Um, then there was a question about, can you explain the three-day situation if there was anything the woman in MJ's example could have done to make her situation different? Um, so for that, the Medicare has changed, and I apologize, John, you might be getting into this in a future no, actually, slide. James couldn't have given us a better question to set this yeah, up yeah. here, so take it away and I'll finish okay. the point. So Medicare has basically changed things along the way, meaning back in the day, back when my maybe my grandma first had it or my parents first had it, um, Medicare was covering things. They've changed things along the way. And right now, um, your nursing home is not going to be covered unless you are staying overnight at a facility, not under observation status, which we'll talk about, but you are staying overnight in a facility for three overnight stays. In her situation, she was not overnight three nights. So here's the challenge. We don't know when something happens to us, if we're going to be overnight in a hospital for three days, or if it's going to be one or two. In her situation, it was one. So there really wasn't a whole heck of a lot she could have done differently other than maybe had the plan in place to fill that gap. Um, and then I know there was somebody that raised their hand, so maybe we can come back to that. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that at the end, okay. but uh, that's a great explanation. And what MJ is talking about, and, and James, I appreciate that question, because this is this is about Medicare, that myth that Medicare pays for everything. We're going to dive much deeper into this, into 201 here on the 16th, but just at a high level, Medicare pays if you spend, or pays for skilled nursing care. They will pay for it after you have a three-day hospital stay. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. They will cover the first 20 days 100%. After that, you're going to be responsible for 185 days for the balance of 100 days. After 100 days, Medicare pays zero at that point. The critical thing is, is that hospital stay. Now, in MJ's case, her, her, uh, the lady stayed only one night. So it wouldn't have mattered what procedure she had had done. It wouldn't have mattered anything. She was one night. Medicare classifies procedures based on inpatient or observation status. So say I go in and I've got a procedure and I spend three nights in the hospital and the lady next to me has a different procedure, but we stay the same time, same amount of days, three nights in the hospital. So we're there about three nights in the hospital. If my procedure was not coded as an a, a inpatient stay, only as an observation status because of the type of procedure it was, I would receive none of the skilled nursing benefits from Medicare, while the lady next to me, if her, her procedure was classified as inpatient stay, an inpatient procedure, she would receive those benefits. Medicare moves procedures all across the board every year. If you were with us with our Medicare webinar, we talked about that. Every year, that's how they cut costs, by moving procedures that used to be inpatient to observation status. Doesn't always change the amount of days you stay in the hospital. It changes that skilled recare, recovery care after the fact. So some uh, good things to understand there. Great question, James. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, especially in 201 and get much more in depth there. Again, we talk about observation status. It is simply a Medicare coding issue. And hospitals are so keen on making sure they get the proper coding right, because if there's a readmission to somebody, they lose Medicare funding. So it's easier and cheaper for them to say, we're going to put you in observation status, you still get the same care but there's no readmittance penalties and things like that. So again, the outpatient, important to understand this. Uh, MJ and her team can help explain that to you as well. So that's a great thing there. So we talked about the solution. We talked about a big picture solution. We're going to go much more in depth at 201, a long-term care type of plan. And there's many types out there. And that's real important to understand because MJ and her team can help you understand each one of those. It can supplement your out-of-pocket expenses help you pay for those things completely there. It can protect your assets that maybe you need to have for your spouse to continue to live. For example, for my, for my stepmother, she still was working. She couldn't afford to take off and, and, and quit her job to take care of my father. Fortunately, he had a, a plan that provided care for him so she could continue to work. And then she went and saw him every night after work. You know, uh, keeping, if there's home expenses, things like that, those expenses still need to go on. It also can help you preserve that legacy. You may have been intending to pass on money for kids, grandkids, college, things like that. 
and not having to spend it that way. This is another alternative there. Keep you connected to those things that are most important to you out there as well. The stay at home benefits are the thing that I want you to key in most on here. A good extended care policy, whether it's long-term care, short-term care, recovery care, whatever the name of it is, helps you with your home tasks. Someone to come in cleaning, cooking, meal prep, bathing, those type of things. Then a nurse can come in with some of the wound care, physical therapy things that you need as well. A really good plan can help you retrofit your home. If all it takes is to put bars in the bathroom or a ramp or some widening of the doors to keep you at home as opposed to taking you to a facility, that's what everybody wants to do. Nobody wants to have to leave their home because it, you can't still live in it, that type of thing. So again, a good plan can help you with that, provide some money towards that, lump sum, things of that nature. Some plans allow you to get cash and just says, boom, here you are, you qualify, here's cash for you. You can use it however you want to. Some are simply, like I mentioned, reimbursement. Once you get what your costs are, the, the nursing home facility or the care provider sends that bill in and they reimburse whatever that cost is there. So actual costs. So there's different type of plans that you have out there as well. And MJ mentioned this, as you get older, we know that cognitive impairments happen, falls, cancer, you know, things like that happen. It gets more difficult to qualify the older that you get. So that's why we encourage you, look at something today. The old phrase, you know, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today, is to look at it now before a health issue comes up, before maybe you've got elderly parents that are still alive, before they may have health issues that would prevent you from qualifying because of health history in the family, things like that. So it's important to understand that that, that goes up and then premiums go up. The cost of waiting can get more expensive, so it can cost you more. These are just sample rates. Don't worry about that. I just wanted to show you what an example could be, that the longer that you wait, it could get more expensive over your lifetime to wait for that. And there are other options. And we're going to tackle this in 201. MJ and her team can help you out on that. That have to do with wiping out that elimination period. Bigger daily amounts or accelerating the, the, the money up front. One of the things we're going to talk about in 201 is how long the average person needs care, both male and female. And so you can kind of help adjust what that could be as well. Although I met people that were in the facility where my dad was for his two years of life that had been there seven, eight, nine years, you know, so you just never know, especially when you get into the Alzheimer's patients that may have no other health issues. They could live for many, many years out there. So there are other options. And that's what MJ and her team can do for you in terms of where you get taken care of, non-skilled services, ways that you don't have to worry about damaging the generations behind you, that they can still continue to, to, to provide for themselves and not have to take care of uh, stopping their, their, their careers to provide care. So I'm gonna stop here and open it up for questions. There are two or three ways that we can do this. If you have questions that you want MJ and her team to specifically cover with you, your WREA endorsed options, that type of thing, the best way is to take your smartphone. Take your smartphone, open up your camera on your smartphone, hover over that QR code, a little form is going to pop up. You can select long-term care, short-term care, recovery care, type something in the bottom that says, hey, I need help, review my policy, benefits, that kind of stuff. Put your information in there, send it off, we'll take care of getting it to MJ. If you don't have access to your phone, you don't feel comfortable doing that, my email address is down there. It's john.green at amba.info. MJ is going to put her email address in the chat, her phone number. The one thing that MJ and her team are committed to and have committed back to WREA is that if you have a question, they will always call you back. And that way you see her phone number or somebody else's phone number. They identify themselves as with AMBA calling on behalf of WREA so that you know who we are to take care of you, to be a partner in that regards out there. So I'm going to open it up for questions, put that in there. I'm going to come back and show you this here in a moment, the QR code, my phone number, or my email address, MJ's and all that. And we'll ask some questions here in a moment. Just a couple of reminders. We've really hit on just the basics today. We're going to go much more in depth on the 16th. We're going to talk about that Medicare, what they will and won't pay more in depth. We're going to go more in depth about 
who needs care and how long they need care, what the average is. We polled several retirees that have long-term care and what it means to them. We're going to show you some of that. Talk about alternatives to long-term care. MJ touched a little bit on that, whether you've got gotten declined in the past or you've got family history, something like that, what those options are, ways that you can protect yourself even without long-term care. So we're going to show you those type of things as well. Then in March, we're going to talk about all the latest discounts that are out there, fun stuff like that. And then on the 16th, we're going to talk about protecting your nest egg. This stock market is crazy. What are you going to do to protect your nest egg? And we'll kind of roll through that as well. So don't forget to tell your former coworkers, your friends about WREA, about these webinars. We do record these. Annalise showed you exactly where those recordings are. I would highly, highly, highly encourage you to sit down with your children or to sit down with your brothers and sisters if you still have parents that are alive. Review this. Watch this webinar. Have that discussion. The time to have the discussion is now, not when it's time to put mom into a nursing facility or when it's time to decide, all right, who's going to take care of mom right now? That type of thing. The time is now to do that. And so this is the best way to get that conversation started, just to have that out on the table, because there may be some presuppositions that you're going to be responsible for mom. I'm not taking care of her, that kind of thing. Make sure you get all those kind of things out on the table now and uh, get that taken care of that way. So we're going to stop recording right now. And...